This one's wife, a day at Monty Shit Show. Hello, I'm H.G. Tudor. There's much comedic value that could be had in envisaging a day at the mansion at Monty Shit Show. A day where the Sussexes don't go anywhere but stay at home. Nevertheless, what I'm going to provide to you is an example of what a typical day might look for them vis-a-vis her narcissism, which after all, this is what this channel is about. So picture, if you will, this one's wife is asleep. At this point, her narcissism isn't doing anything because there's nobody to control. There's no need for fuel or character traits or residual benefits because she's fast asleep. She then wakes up. On this occasion, we'll assume that Harry is allowed in the bed. It might be as part of his sustained evaluation that he'd been ordered to one of the other rooms or the chicken coop. But on this occasion, he's fallen asleep inside the bed alongside her. When she awakens, her fuel level will be extremely low indeed, because while she's been asleep, her fuel has naturally eroded. This means the presence of the creature becomes more tangible. The creature lurking in the chasm. She doesn't know what that is, but it's a reminder of her incompetence, a reminder of weakness and vulnerability. It mocks her, and her narcissism immediately, like a flame on a boiler bursting into life, must take steps to protect her. And the first thing it must do is seek to assert control over Harry, because he is on her radar next to her, and draw fuel from him. Now, it might be the case that Harry's had a bit of a late night. It might be that he was up playing Call of Duty until goodness knows what time. And an empathic person would look at the time on the bedside clock, or on their wristwatch, or on their phone, and think to themselves, Oh, well, it's still quite early. I'm awake. I'll uh, let him lie in and I'll go and deal with the kids. But not this one's wife. Her narcissism needs to him to be controlled. And whilst he sleeps, he's in effect ignoring her, which causes wounding. This, added to the fact that she hasn't had any fuel yet, is problematic. And therefore her narcissism compels her to take action. If Harry were in the golden period or he was in a respite period, she would likely wake him, wake him up by kissing him and getting down to some spicy poontang with him. But on this occasion, he's in the sustained devaluation, there is no respite period. And therefore, her narcissism causes her to look at him with contempt, deeming him lazy for lying there still asleep when the day has already started. And thus, with that thought and feeling in her mind... She will then elbow him awake. The ginger one stirs. His reaction to being elbowed by her provides her with some fuel. And already the sensation of that fuel is felt. Her narcissism compels her to elbow him again. So she does. This time he awakens. Yeah, what is it, darling? He asks. His response, albeit a question, isn't one that's challenging and he provides her with fuel. That sweet, delicious fuel coming from a very potent source, the intimate partner primary source, and is substantial in amount. Why? Because he's lying next to her. He's physically proximate. And therefore, his physical gesture, the tone of his voice, the words used, his facial expression, the look in his sleep-filled eyes, all contributes to a large amount of fuel. Get up, she says. The days are wasting. Oh! Darling, I'm just going to sleep on a little bit longer. He's failing to do what she wants. And in the circumstances, that is challenge fuel. The fuel is flowing, that's all good. But she must now put down this mini insurrection that has taken place by him suggesting he's going to stay in bed. Therefore, her narcissism opts for a revision of history. And she announces, 
I've got off every day this week with the kids while you've just laid there, you lazy so-and-so. That isn't actually true. Harry's been the one who's got up earlier, but that doesn't matter because her narcissism has revised history, compelling her to tell that lie. Harry, becoming accustomed to the downside of not doing what she orders him to do, blearily sits up. He then moves across to her. How about a little bit of you-know-what before we go and see the kids, he says, feeling a little bit randy. And although this is fuel that's provided towards her, her narcissism deems that it's not necessary for her to engage in any of the hanky-panky with him, and therefore decides that she must nullify that threat to control. Ugh, she says, your breath stinks, devaluing him with an insult and shoving him away. She knows that he's now under control, or subconsciously recognises that, and she's received fuel from him. Reasonable amounts which have come on repeated occasions, culminating in the sensation of power. She doesn't feel like she can conquer the world, but it certainly caused the chasm to recede. She rises and goes to the bathroom to attend to her ablutions. At this juncture, there's nobody on the radar. Therefore, her narcissism is not causing her to need to assert control over anybody. She showers, dresses, and then comes downstairs to find that the nanny is already dealing with the two children. For the sake of this example, we assume they exist and are living at Monty Shit Show. Because there's another person available, it's necessary for her facade management to kick in. And therefore, in order to draw fuel and look good in front of the nanny, she approaches the children full of enthusiasm. My little darling, she announces, giving them a hug and a kiss and engaging with them. She receives fuel by way of their responses. Its potency is moderate because they're non-intimate secondary sources. They're easy to control. They respond favourably to her intervention, even though Archie wonders, where is the tree? Thus done, the two children being under control and having provided her with more fuel, the nanny also does provide her with fuel and show that she's under control by greeting this one's wife. All three are under control. The narcissism deems there's no necessity of continued interaction with them. And therefore, rather than continue to deal with her own children, she leaves them to the nanny, showing her lack of accountability. The narcissism is focused on her needs, not the needs of the children. Thus, she walks away and enters the kitchen. There, she starts to prepare something for herself to eat. Harry wanders in. He's in sustained devaluation, and it may well be that his very presence offends her. The consequence that he is then rounded on by her. What are you doing in here? She demands. Harry's confused. Uh, his response isn't good enough. He's showing that he's not under control. Go and see to the children. Uh, but the nanny's with them, he announces. So they're your kids, she declares, demonstrating her hypocrisy that she's standing there with whatever green tea she's drinking and whatever concoction is in her breakfast bowl while she's not dealing with them. And thus Harry is dispatched to go and deal with the children. He demonstrates he's under control. Thereafter, this one's wife, full of her own self-importance, heads into the office. It is there that she engages and undoubtedly takes certain action to bolster her own sense of self-importance. At this point, this one's wife has received fuel from Harry on a number of occasions, the nanny and the children. So her fuel level is rising but more is still needed. All four of those individuals are under control. None of them are on her radar at this point. Now she checks upon her emails and fires away some responses. She receives minimal fuel because it's in writing, but responds to inquiries perhaps from the agency, issuing some demands about where are we with this project? When are you going to get your finger out and ensure that I star in Bodyguard 2? Another email is sent to another agent. When is the TIG going to be relaunched? Where is my Dior deal? All of this is done in a haughty, demanding way as she asserts control by way of hoovering these individuals through the email. She then checks social media. Many narcissists that are a higher echelon wouldn't bother with this. But this one's wife does. It provides her with fuel where there's favourable comment. So, for example, she looks at a processic site to begin with 
And there, there are various comments about an appearance she made a day or two ago from the sugars. The tertiary source is therefore the potency is not great, and the amounts are small because they're in writing, but it's fuel nevertheless, and they all demonstrate that they're under control. She then scrolls to some of the newspapers and news reports, and it shows, first of all, that there is the nemesis, the Princess of Wales, at a charity event, looking graceful and stylish, with various headlines praising what she's wearing and what she's doing. This wounds this one's wife. Her narcissism needs her to get control over the Princess of Wales. It isn't going to move her to ring her up and say, you didn't look that nice, you skinny bitch, because she doesn't have the capability to get through to her directly, and the narcissism knows that. Instead, there's a yell of, Harry! And thus Harry is summoned. If he doesn't come immediately, that wounds her further as a failure of his as a consequence of his failure to respond to her demand. He comes stumbling through, yogurt dripping from his chin. What is it? What is it, my little mayfly? Have you seen this? She yells, showing him the picture. Once upon a time, Harry would have gone, wow, but he knows better than to do so now. And he said, hmm, yes, looking very skinny, isn't she? He suggests. He feels bad about what he's saying because he still actually has a secret crush on his sister-in-law. But he knows that were he to say that she looks wow, the old pink pods would become pink pancakes. As a consequence of his confirmation that the Princess of Wales looks far too skinny, this satisfies his handler. He demonstrates that he is under control and has provided her with yet more fuel, and also provides her with a subconscious sense of indirect control over the Princess of Wales. She then clicks on another screen to see that already HG Tudor has created a further video calling out her recent ridiculous appearance. She groans as she sees this once again, wounded by the or rather issued with challenge fuel as a consequence of the headline of the appropriate video that I have created. Oh, Harry is about to say, I find Tudor really amusing. I watch him in secret, but then knows that he's going to get the pink pods tasered. And therefore he adjusts. Oh, damn cad, he announces. I'll find the bounder and give him a thrashing. Once again, Harry demonstrates that he is under control and he's provided yet more fuel to this one's wife. Furthermore, by berating the mighty H.G. Tudor, he's also ensured that she subconsciously feels a sense of control over, over me. Harry has served his purpose. You can go now, she says. Oh, right, OK. And he scurries away, thus showing that he's under control. And she gets back to doing what little work that's involved, scouring social media. Where she sees anything favourable, it provides her with fuel and makes her feel in control. Where it's critical, it will cause a problem for her in terms of challenge fuel. Likely at this juncture, she will just dismiss it by staying in a position of withdrawal. She makes some telephone calls and calls her mother, the trusted lieutenant. Doria is under control and her responses provide fuel from a non-intimate secondary source and also the residual benefit as she confirms that she will be available to watch Archie and Lilibet later that day in case she wants to head out to the farmer's market and be papwalked. This one's wife then makes arrangements to contact the agency, the photo agency, to tell them that at 2pm she'll be heading out for a pap walk and if they want to send a photographer they ought to do so. They agree this tertiary source demonstrating that they're under control and providing her with fuel. At this point, the nanny, the children and Harry are not on the radar. She ends the call with Doria having received yet more fuel. Notice that her fuel matrix is catering to her pretty well at this juncture. The intimate partner primary source comes to heal whenever required and provides fuel. The non-intimate secondary source of the nanny greeted her, providing her with fuel, ditto the children, ditto her mother. She will have received a smattering of fuel from the tertiary sources through emails and also through what is placed upon social media. She will also have received challenge fuel from the likes of any videos that she looks upon that are critical of her and critical comments in the press and social media. 
Thus, she's not going to have any difficulty with her fuel levels whatsoever. Very potent fuel coming from Harry, moderate potency coming from the children and the nanny and her mother, less potent fuel coming from the likes of social media and emails. In terms of amounts, large amounts from Harry, large amounts from the children and the nanny, even though for a short period of time, moderate amount from Doria, because it was over the telephone, and small amounts from that which is in writing, in messages, etc. But all of this, at this early stage of the morning, already provides her with decent enough fuel to move her away from any sensation of the creature making its presence felt. Instead, she starts to feel relatively buoyant. The emptiness recedes because of the receipt of the fuel. And at this juncture, she has, as is always the case, successfully ensured that control has either been maintained or has been achieved in relation to the various appliances that she has had some form of interaction with. We're only at mid-morning, but it already demonstrates to you the way that she can soon get fueled and the way that she utilises various forms of manipulation, both benign in terms of greeting the children warmly and saying hello to the nanny, and malign, insulting Harry, accusing him of having smelly breath and revising history with regard to his involvement with the children. The way that she utilises indirect assertion of control in respect of seeing unfavourable commentary about her in the press, the presence of the nemesis, and also my videos. So it gives you a very useful cross-section, and that's just the first part of the morning. I'll be continuing the day at Monty's shit show in future parts to show various further aspects of the narcissistic dynamic as we move through a typical day for this one's wife. But that gives you a taster of what it's like for her from the moment she wakes for the first two or three hours of her morning. I'm H.G. Tudor. Thank you for listening.